So the first part of our talk will be an oxygen overview, and hopefully at the end of this talk we can determine what is a good fit for you. Um, I have no disclosures. So the objectives today are testing methods, we will discuss the various modalities of oxygen delivery, and pros and cons of each method. So breathing basics. Um, I know it's sometimes we find that people take, especially in your case, that breathing is taken for granted, but um, breathing is an active process of inhalation it, to provide oxygen to the alveoli which then is exchanged with carb, Ooh, sorry. My apologies. Back, okay. Um, which is then exchanged with carbon dioxide to nearby capillaries. So in order for effective gas exchange to occur, um, our alveoli need to be ventilated, as you can see in this first picture here. This is a uh, normal lung up at the top. And then at the bottom, in our case with our patients, um, abnormalities in the lung show move, um, slows movement to the bloodstream. Sorry, I just need to move this over a little bit, okay. Um, to the bloodstream, which impairs perfusion. So how is oxygen measured? So we have two modalities. We have indirect, which is with our um, pulse oximetry, whether it's on your forehead, on your finger, um, to measure our oxygen saturation. Also, six-minute walk tests or um, exercise testing. And then also continuous monitoring, which can occur in a hospital setting. Uh, directly, which can occur with either a blood sample, which is drawn from an artery in your, drawn from your artery or your vein. And in order to qualify for oxygen, you have to um, have a PaO2 of below 55%. This can also be done during a test called HAS testing. It's a high altitude simulation testing. So for those who do not require oxygen um, at sea level, um, this testing can be done to determine whether or not oxygen is required once um, you're on a plane. So continued, so in order to meet <coughs> Medicare guidelines, which is generally the standard for oxygen um, requirements, um, you need to have an oxygen saturation of 88% or below, which can be um, at rest and with exertion. So if you're short of breath, doesn't necessarily mean that you require oxygen. Not necessarily. So other things that can cause shortness of breath um, or a greater work of breathing can be fluid around your lungs, um, otherwise known as pleural effusion, muscle deconditioning, and um, your body habitus. So being underweight or overweight can actually cause uh, shortness of breath. Also um, anxiety and panic. So DME companies in order, so durable medical equipment. So once, if you do require oxygen, um, that order is sent to your durable medical equipment company. Your company is mandated to supply both a home unit, a stationary home concentrator, and portable oxygen. Portable, what most patients actually prefer are called um, portable oxygen concentrators. Those are actually considered a luxury item. So depending on what's available to that company will determine whether or not a patient can acquire one. Also your oxygen needs. Also, your company really does matter. So if you are, sorry, if you are on oxygen, um, Having a company that's either nationally recognized, such as Lincare, Apria, um, Adapt Home Health, that can actually determine if you are one to travel, whether or not oxygen will be supplied in your local community. If you, um, local and upon travel, but if you have a local community, which they only service, let's say, an immediate area, having your oxygen needs met with travel can 
at times be cumbersome. So this is something that we'll discuss further on later on, but um, it is it does make a difference. So one may ask who's footing the bill. So both Medicare and private insurance do cover home oxygen. Um, again, you, oxygen testing needs to be provided at the time um, that your order is submitted. If you meet the conditions above, <coughs> obviously your insurance will help pay for it. Um, it's covered a home unit, the supplies that are associated with that unit, and your portable oxygen. Also, the maintenance of that device is um, the maintenance of that device is covered by your insurance company. If you have any issues with your device, you should reach out to your, comp to your company to have that device service. So that means your humidifiers, your filters, tubing. If there's any electrical issues, you should address that with your company. Um, your oxygen company covers you for a minimum of 34 months. So when you sign up with your company, they have you sign a contract. It's really important that you actually review this contract before you sign it. So you're essentially signing up with a company for five years. Oxygen companies are paid up front for your services. With that being said, if they cannot meet your needs, one, you can switch over to another company. But what we're finding is that if they're paid up front, having those funds transition to another company can be cumbersome. It's not, it doesn't mean that it can't be done, but your needs need to be met by your company. If they're not met by your company, then please raise hell. <laughs> um, so essentially, 36 months, for a minimum of 36 months in which you have to stay with your company, unless there are, as I stated, other caveats and then your supplies are covered for an additional 24 months. So types of supplemental oxygen. So we have our concentrators, which are home units and also portable. They run on electricity. Um, we also have oxygen cylinders, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's what's primarily used in um, doctor's offices and those who actually require essentially high flow oxygen. Um, back to home concentrators, they do um, provide, some do provide high flow. And then liquid oxygen, which is kind of like the unicorn of oxygen currently. It is in limited supply across the United States. Some areas do have it. I'm fortunate in the East Coast that we do have some companies that provide it, but it's being phased out due to cost. <coughs> So pros of home concentrators, um, it is passive. It is constant delivery. So if it's on your face or not, it will deliver oxygen. It is cost effective, and it does have various leader flows. Generally, you go from one to five, then there's some that go up to eight, and then 10, and some that go up to 15. And it is electricity dependent. With that being stated, um, in regards to electricity dependent, Oxygen companies should be providing you, especially if you're in an area prone to blackouts, with a backup tank. It stays in your closet, should be able to provide up to six hours of oxygen. Also, with that being said, ask for a letter from your provider to supply to your electrical company stating that your electricity will not be turned off due to failure to pay if there's any um, financial issues at some point. Um, and notify your local fire department as well that you are in, um, you have a need of oxygen. So that way, if there's an emergency, they know to come to you. If there's a blackout, hopefully your electricity is placed first and that there's hopefully no um, suspension in service if there were ever any financial um, hardships. Cons, um, home concentrators are not readily portable depending on the size. Also a con electricity dependent due to costs. They do um, produce a lot of heat, which I'm sure many of you know. And it's limited to the supply. It's limited to the company in regards to supply. So if your local company does not provide concentrators that are 10 liters or above, that can be an issue should you require that much oxygen. <coughs> So compressed oxygen um, that's used for portable. So very, the sizes that are common are an E-tank, um, just 
a notification in regards to this. This is, the time is related to a full size tank. There have been numerous times that patients have told me that they've had their tanks delivered and they weren't full or they ran out sooner than they normally do. So an E-tank um, can provide four to six liters, about one and a half to two and a half hours um, continuous on pulse, which is determined by a regulator. It can last anywhere from five to eight hours. An M6 tank, which is about the size of a wine bottle, but it's rather portable. Um, they have different, again, different regulators and switching, you can switch between continuous and pulse dose. And then home fill systems, which you, utilizes smaller tanks, which are C and D tanks. Um, patients can actually fill those at home. So compressed oxygen, pros, you have high flow, continuous op um, options depending on the regulator. It can be portable either via bag or trolley. Um, it is pure oxygen. And um, with your home fill system, if that's what you have, you don't have to wait for delivery of tanks. Now the cons, which many of you know, is that their, their size, um, they can be cumbersome and um, heavy. You do require delivery and you cannot travel um, via air with them. And um, traveling with them in a vehicle has its, um, its regulations and caveats. So portable oxygen concentrators, um, they vary. So when looking for, a, you know, looking for a portable concentrator, everyone wants one that's light, but in actuality, they range from three to 18 pounds. The size that is, um, the size that is, I guess, advertised is generally the size without the battery. So please take that into consideration. Your battery that's used to uh, concentrate ambient air pulls air in and then uses a filter to exchange no nitrogen in which turns it into oxygen is about 95, 85 to 95%. And your charge time varies and that is dependent on the POC. So continuous flow utilizes more battery and there are not that many concentrators that do deliver um, continuous flow oxygen. And if searching for a continuous flow device, if you're looking for size, that is not synergistic. They do not mean the same. Um, so that may be limiting in versus want and, and need. Um, in order to um, obtain an adequate amount of oxygen, it actually is dependent on your rate of breathing. So with these devices, you know, if it states it goes from one to six, you know, it's not necessarily about the liter flow. It really is dependent on how your rate of breathing. So when these devices are advertised, it really is a matter of are, am I breathing at 20 breaths a minute or am I breathing at 10? No one's really breathing at 10. In this population, our respiratory rates are 20 and up. So whether or not that's an actual positive device for you or an adequate device for you is something that needs to be assessed prior to making a purchase or acquiring <coughs> one of these devices. Now, it does run on um, it's electric, obviously, runs on battery, and these are the only FAA-approved devices in which you can travel on a plane. So pros are that they are lightweight and that you can use, utilize them for air travel, um, and they utilize a DC outlet. If traveling overseas, please have the appropriate um, attachment with that. Um, you can utilize, you can, they do have extended batteries, but you do need, um, several batteries or a car charger for extended time, and it can be utilized in a backpack, but it has to be breathable. So a con, um, the lighter the POC, generally the lower the oxygen um, delivery capacity. And then um, majority of these devices utilize pulse dose, and as stated before, it's not equal to liters per minute. And this can be confusing to patients and clinicians when there's a desire to provide one of these. Um, or acquire one. Most settings, most POCs at a setting of six really only deliver anywhere from one to about 1.75, two liters per minute. And that puff is not equivalent to liters per minute. Now, 
depending on your respiratory rate, it actually can trigger, it's triggered when you're breathing at a higher rate to shut off. And it should indicate that you need to transition to a continuous device. It can be alarming, especially if you're away from your home unit and it's not something that's it's, that's you know known amongst um, clinicians. So it isn't until it happens. So we try to be very um, we just try to be very transparent. And I hope that if you haven't acquired one of these and it's something that you um, are interested in, that you actually do get tested on one of these devices prior to purchasing one. So. Um, and, uh, and not adequate disease, so, uh, adequate um, oxygen. And then also we want to be aware of non-centrators which are marketed online. So if it's on Amazon, Home Depot, Rite Aid, comes in a can, it's not real oxygen. Don't buy it, don't use it, it is not FDA approved, there is no regulation, no one can ascertain as to what it is that you're getting. So. Definite con, definite no. So liquid oxygen, as I stated before, is uh, the unicorn of oxygen. Um, pros is that it delivers anywhere from, it can deliver any amount of oxygen, honestly, but four to 15 liters using a portable canister. It's essentially frozen and um, it can be in a home fill system. Portable um, canisters, they last longer anywhere from six to eight hours, if not longer, depending on your oxygen rate. But it is only viable for about 24 hours. So it isn't something that you can um, take with you overnight. So as stated, canisters evaporate over time. They can leak and freeze. There is a type of a finesse when using these, and these canisters must stay upright. And again, as stated previously, they're no longer they're not widely available um, due to costs. So types of flow. So as stated, we have continuous flow, it's passive delivery, and then pulse and demand flow is triggered, um, whether it's in a gas canister or a POC device. And um, they're both delivered at a set amount of oxygen per minute, well, aside from the POCs, as stated previously. And then, um, they are, I would say, sorry, I just lost my train of thought there. Okay. Um, again, on pulse and continuous flow. So there is a wonderful guide called Running on Air from Mary um, Kilt, I can never put her name right, Kiltlowski. Um, and it actually shows, um, the delivery of oxygen and from POC devices and as to the actual um, liters per minute. This was a very extensive effort on her part and her team. It's a wonderful resource. So definitely discuss with your provider prior to purchasing one if that's something that you're interested in. So that way your oxygen needs can be met. So benefits of supplemental oxygen, it can help decrease your shortness of breath, can actually help and is fundamental with exercise. It helps improve ADLs, um, your activities of daily living. It can help with post-exertional fatigue and actually help avoid the fatigue that generally would be um, associated with, ox with ex exertion without oxygen. Um, it does improve quality of life. Granted, with that being said, we don't take lightly that we are placing patients on oxygen, and we know that it is a fundamental change, um, but it, it really does have a benefit. And you know, the goal is to increase your lifespan by decreasing the extra work that you're putting on your heart by not utilizing oxygen with exertion, um, especially if you have, with low oxygen uh, saturations, it can cause um, stress, physical stress overall on your heart. These are my references. Thank you. And, uh, and I just want you to all know that I think that every one of you is more of an expert in oxygen delivery and oxygen technique than actually most people who work in medicine. 
Um, do people in the world know the most about this equipment? And it's you and respiratory therapists, and I would argue that I think you know more about this than the RTs. Sorry, no, Greenspan. We have the privilege in the back of having a respiratory therapist join us today. Oh, you're not an RD? No. Ah, but you know a lot about respiratory medicine. All right, so I have no disclosures. And uh, so I'm going to talk with you guys about fire sa uh, oxygen safety. And, and safety isn't just about the equipment, but it's about what I think about what oxygen can do in terms of like pressure injuries, falls risks, and we're going to talk a little bit about traveling with oxygen. So first of all, with fire safety, and I know this is really scary, and a lot of my patients think that oxygen is just combustible, right? That oxygen is just uh, this flammable gas. And it's not. It's not the Hindenburg, okay? But if you see this little, and we all learned this, I think, at some point in school, that fire needs, you know, heat, oxygen, and fuel, right? And so things that normally would not burn in the presence of supplemental oxygen are more likely to start, start a fire. So by and far, and I had a chart, but it was just too laborious for you all to look at, like 90, 95% of all fires in the home with oxygen are associated with somebody who's smoking a cigarette. And in general, most of my patients who have interstitial lung disease don't smoke anymore. There's a few who do, okay, and I have no judgment for that whatsoever, but so if anybody's still smoking or somebody in your life smokes, it's just time to stop. <laughs> and so, that, and that's again, it's not a, a shameful statement at all. Um, and the big thing is, this time of year, we're about to go into fall, and everyone loves to light candles, right, and love to burn things around their house, and it smells so festive. So there's lots of really great ways you can make your home smell nice without having to light a candle. Um, and then in my state, I'm from Colorado. We don't have a lot of fireworks that are legal, right, because um, it tends to set a lot of forest fires. Um, depending <coughs> upon where you live, people might be setting off firecrackers and little sparklers and whatnot, and they just cannot do that in your presence. And then... Um, the gas patio heaters, that's a really popular thing now, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like every time I go to a restaurant, I see one of those. So in general, my rule is at least be about 10 feet away. Okay, it doesn't mean that you can't see these things at all, but, but keep your distance. Um, obviously, no smoking. Um, and then it's obviously people who come into your home. And so sometimes people just forget, right? So it's okay to put up a sign. It's all right to have something outside your home that says, hey, oxygen in use. And there's no shame or blame in that. And, and one thing that is not part of my slide set, but it's really important to me, is, is your rights as someone who uses oxygen. I mean, right now in this room, we're talking about the most important, in my opinion, the most important drug we have in pulmonary medicine, right? I have all these other drugs that I can prescribe to slow your fibrosis or to calm your autoimmune condition, but the thing that's been shown to help extend life and reduce you from getting right-sided heart failure is this equipment. And when I see someone who wears oxygen, I think that you're fierce and I think that you're amazing and, and you know, and, and I want you to see yourselves that way. Um, so the big thing too is get a smoke detector and we should all have this, particularly one that's in the bedroom because most of you are sleeping with oxygen in your room at night. And, and a smoke detector really should be on any floor of your home, not just where you sleep. Um, and then the fire extinguisher, the same thing. Multi-level homes don't have just a fire extinguisher that's in the kitchen, right? If you spend most of your time in your basement or somewhere else, have it there. The last thing you want is there to be a fire and be like, gosh, I have to run upstairs with my interstitial lung disease and go grab my fire extinguisher, like let it be close by. Uh, additionally, cotton bedding. Cotton bedding is really important because it's all about static electricity. And again, those things that normally would not spark become more fire risk in the presence of, of supplemental oxygen. Um, all these other things, again, are about sparks, hair dryers, curling irons, electric razors. Um, I'm also going to talk to you here briefly about petroleum-based products. Um, Vaseline, and if you grew up in my generation, my mother was a fan that Vicks VapoRub would cure anything in your life, right? And in your nose, on your chest, in a humidifier, it's, I, uh, I'm probably going to have HP at some point in my history. So the reason for this is that we don't like oil, right? We don't like flammable things near your oxygen. And, and petroleum-based products are flammable. I work in ILD. I really don't like it because there's a chance that if you put a bunch of Vicks or a bunch of Vaseline in your nose, that you could actually inhale these lipoid molecules into your lung, and then you can actually get another type of lung injury um, called lipoid interstitial pneumonia. And, and on top of what you already have, it's just not a good idea. Um, 
I've prescribed oxygen probably for the last decade as a nurse practitioner, and I was completely unaware that these devices existed until the lovely Susan Jacobs filled me in. So each one of these devices, and there's the Fire Safe and then the MK3, I have it on if anybody needs to know these. These are actually bi-directional valves that if for whatever reason that you are wearing your oxygen and a fire should start, either from your concentrator, okay, or if you're smoking, and again, no judgment, please think about quitting, um, these valves are like a shutoff. In other words, if a fire is coming from the concentrator and it's, it's traveling up the tube, this device actually will stop the fire from ascending. And, and it works, like I said, both directions. It'll stop the fire from going down if you're smoking to your oxygen concentrator potentially causing an explosion. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, as far as managing your equipment, big thing here is that concentrator needs to go into the wall by itself. No power strips, no extension cords. Um, and think about this grounded outlet. I have this wonderful patient of mine who was traveling and he went to this totally like tiny motel in the middle of nowhere and he plugged his concentrator in and he blew out power to the whole place. And uh, I was like, oh my God, and I never really thought about that. But you gotta think about it. Like that machine wants and deserves a good flow of electricity into it and you don't want anything that's going to compete. Um, think about it as well as this concentrator needs to breathe. Just like you guys are breathing, how this device works is it's pulling air in, right? There's a filter in there that's trying to extract the nitrogen because our air, like, is I, just in case you guys didn't know, the air is majority nitrogen, right? 21% oxygen. So we're trying to remove the nitrogen, concentrate oxygen so that oxygen flows out to you. So think about it breathing, right? So I get that this isn't the most beautiful piece of equipment in your home, right? And nobody just wants to have it out and seen so everybody can look at it. But again, looking at this, that's my powerful drug, and I don't care what people think when they come into my home. So don't hide it behind a curtain. Don't have it, and, and don't use it to store laundry on top of, right? Like it, it, think of this as a machine that's alive and that needs to breathe. Um, and then clean your filters, and there's some really good online tutorials. You can go to YouTube and see um, how to like just take a small screwdriver, take the filter off, rinse it with water. Um, each and every one of you deserve to have your DME company come out at least once a year and service this device. And why this is so important is, in good faith, you turn this device on. And let's say you set it to four liters of flow and that's what you think you're getting. And, uh, but I've had patients sometimes who come and see me and they're like, oh, I'm so short of breath, my sats are dropping. And I do a walk test, I'm like, well, it, it's fine. When I walk you on four liters of compressed air, your oxygen levels look great. And then the problem was the machine the machine was not giving the flow rate that you thought it was. So online, and I meant to have a slide for this, but there's a device called a liter meter. And a liter meter looks like a ballpoint pen, and you can actually take your uh, tubing, put it on the liter meter, turn it on, let's just say to four. Am I getting four liters of flow? And if you're not, that's a call to your DME company and you need a new concentrator. I don't think these concentrators last as long as they should. And if you at all feel like something has changed in your oxygen requirement, that's a good place to start, okay? Um, and then uh, home equipment care, obviously keeping your tubing clean. You know, and if you've had a bad cold and a runny nose, I mean, please, when you're done with your cold, throw this tubing away and get yourself a new set. Ideally, once a week, wash your cannula, warm soapy water, let it dry. Um, and then I put this cat on here because I can't tell you how many patients I've had who are like, gosh, again, I'm very short of breath, my sats are low, and then they have a cat. And, and I have a cat, so I don't mean to throw cats under the, the bus here, but the cat has chewed holes in the tubing. And as we think about a gas, right, here's the concentrator, here's the tubing, oxygens wanna go to the path of least resistance. So it's gonna flow out that little cat hole that's been created, so by the time it gets to you, you're maybe not getting the amount of oxygen you think you're getting. And there's already a little bit of drag inside these tubes anyways. So, you know, they make some, um, oh, what's it called? Um, it's some sort of bitter spray you can use. And that's for your CPAP equipment too. I don't know what it is about animals, but they really like to chew on anything that's important to us. Um, 
Storage, um, again, do not put a tank near heat. I, this should be without saying, but it's just, it's hard sometimes, right? You just want to get things out of the way, but obviously no furnace or radiator and oxygen should go together. Please, please, please have it in a well-ventilated area. So in other words, not in a tiny little, I mean, if you have an open air somewhat closet that's like got lots of room and there's venting to it, but, but don't have this be in the tiniest, tightest place in your house. Um, oxygen should be stored upright. And your DME companies, in my opinion, should provide you with a cart. Um, and then they should also give you a rack. If they don't give you a rack, you can actually buy one of these online uh, to store your cylinders. And there's, if there's no way to store it upright, then please, please, please lay it on its side and use some sort of a block to keep this thing from rolling around. Um, liquid oxygen, which, uh, you know, I love liquid oxygen. I think it's amazing, and I'm going to continue to fight with Susan Jacobs and uh, on lease on, on helping patients keep this. Um, and it's not that it's dangerous, but it's just different, right? You get a, a cylinder delivered to your house that looks like a big R2-D2, and it's full of, of liquid oxygen, and you have a concentrator you can pop on there and fill yourself. The problem is it's going to leak if you put that thing on its side. So I have a patient that wanted to drive from Denver to, I think, Phoenix. He was going to do this big road trip, and he took his liquid oxygen tank, and he laid it on its side in the car. And by the time he got to Phoenix, the liquid oxygen was completely gone. And this is not an easy thing that you can just like, oh, I think I'll just go to the store and fill this up. Like, he was just done. And that was a really hard trip home. Um, if you touch it, liquid oxygen can actually, it's like a, it's, I mean, it's really cold and you can get a freezer burn. Um, backup plans, Anlis mentioned this as well. I mean, we live in a very different world right now. I'm in Florida and I just talked with somebody last night whose home just missed a hurricane, right? We have power outages. Um, I live in Colorado. I feel like it's all the time that something is going down. So just you know, it's like be like a Boy Scout, right? Have a plan. Have a plan for what you're going to do. Have an extra cylinder, and absolutely, um, you should all have your provider. There's a simple thing you can go online with your local power company, write them a letter letting them know that, uh, hey, I'm on oxygen. So, number one, if for whatever reason my payment doesn't go through, don't turn off my power. Um, but also, let your local fire department know. Firemen are really cool. And they actually love it when people in their community come to see them and you just let them know, hey, by the way, I live down the street and I'm on oxygen. If something happens, keep me in mind. Um, falls risk. Falls, falls, falls. Um, I wish I could tell you I never had a patient that tripped over their oxygen tubing, but this is not true. And some of you may or may not want to admit that this has happened in your own homes. Um, and, and the risk factors are... Um, you know, people get deconditioned, right? They're not in as good of strength, which is another reason I want everyone to try and stay strong. Polypharmacy. So the definition of polypharmacy is taking more than six medications. No one has to raise their hand, but I'm going to pretty much guesstimate that a lot of people take more than six drugs. Um, and, and some of those culprits are a lot of medicines that you might already take, right? A water pill, um, an opioid, and I mean, I work in palliative care. I prescribe opioids, and so I tell my patients to be really, really careful when you take my medicine and your oxygen tubing. Um, obviously, if you drink, um, and if you've already fallen before, falling <clears throat> once means that you can fall again. And um, so how do you mitigate that? Um, adequate lighting. Like when you're going to sleep at night, if you can, put a small light in your bathroom on so that you can see it. Um, brightly colored tape. There's all these, like, cool, like, neon like um, green or yellow or whatever just periodically along the route because most oxygen tubing is clear unless you're on high flow and then it's a dark green but in general the connectors tend to be clear um, please for everyone whether you're using oxygen at home or not get rid of your small area rugs I used to work in the ER spent the better part of 20 years there and I can't tell you how many people have tripped and fallen and broken a hip because of you know some cute little rug um, and then physical conditioning. And so they've actually done a study on Tai Chi, which is what this gentleman on the right is doing. And Tai Chi has actually been shown to decrease your falls risk. Um, and I thought that, and improve balance. And, and it's, it's a horrible feeling to not feel strong and feel balanced. And I don't know, that guy looks pretty zen too. Um, this device, um, I researched, it's called Tidy Tubing. And I'm not gonna, I don't work for Tidy Tubing. I'm not <coughs> promoting a device. But this is a retractable uh, tubing, and you can actually um, put three of these together if you want and, uh, and get some pretty good distance. And I thought, that's really cool. And it would also be away from the floor and um, any pets. 
Uh, okay, so we're gonna move quickly to skin issues. And so when we think about skin, um, you know, it's easier to prevent these issues than it is to treat them. So what we're talking about is trying to get some sort of pressure wound on your face or your ears. So the number one thing is look at your skin. And if you can't see the parts of your body that oxygen touches, have somebody else look, right? Check behind your ears. Um, there is a device we use at National Jewish called the Comfort Soft. And uh, it's an oxygen uh, cannula that is really nice and soft and stretchy. And those have been shown to reduce risk. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of some cheek and ear covers you can get. Um, and then think about alternating with a mask. And I know most people in here don't want to think about being on an oxygen mask, but let's just say you're doing stuff at home and or you're wanting to exercise, or you're going to do your exercise bike, or you just need to give your nose a break. Um, there's a mask called an oxy mask, and it can go from anywhere from 1 to 15 liters. And now normally for those of you who have been in a hospital, we always think, oh gosh, you know, you need a non-rebreather if you're using high flow. Well, this mask is really cool. It's got cutouts on it, okay, so you're not going to rebreathe your carbon dioxide. <coughs> And, and like I said, you can use it from 1 to 15 liters, and if you're exercising, most people generally, you know, breathe in and out the mouth when they exercise versus the nose, and it's just nice to give your um, nasal membranes a break. I have this little ear buddy, and you can clip the oxygen to your hat rather than over your ear, and then these uh, little cheek things, but you guys can Google those, and they're available from um, online from Amazon. So real quick on travel. Um, number one, I want you to travel. I want you to live your life as fully as you possibly can using oxygen. And there are ways and means to do this. Um, if you uh, are thinking about being on a plane and how long you're on a plane, you can talk with your provider about getting a high altitude simulation test. Now, what that is is that you go into a chamber and they can adjust the amount of oxygen in that chamber to see what happens to you at, say, 8,000 feet, and that's about cruising altitude of a plane. Um, the downside is more recently, we used to be able to use a HAS test to qualify somebody for oxygen. Otherwise, I could write an oxygen order, but in the last few years, that's gone away. So for my patients who live in high altitude, I actually have to send them to a small facility that's up um, uh, in Frisco, Colorado at 9,000 feet, and I walk them up there. Um, but that's kind of extreme if you guys don't want to come up to Colorado. Um, a couple big things to think about is, Basically plan. How long are you going to be gone? Where are you going to go? What sort of power source is not just with me when I travel, but with me at my um, arrival destination, right? So staying at like a remote cabin, right, that doesn't have a power supply. I mean, I actually have patients that really love to go camping. So if you're going camping, like, you know, try to stay at a cabin, right, that has power. If you have an RV, make sure you're at a place that's got a good hookup. Um, and always carry a copy of your oxygen prescription with you in the event that you're somewhere and you need to get oxygen supplies, it'll be easier to get something. Um, and please think about your infection risk. Um, I know everyone is ridiculously tired and talking about COVID, and I promised I wouldn't bring it up, and here I am. It's not just COVID. I don't want you to get any other virus, right? Rhinovirus this season has been very pathogenic. I don't want you to get RSV. It's like all the other viruses are back, and they're trying to compete. So just um, think about if you're at an airport or you're on a bus, please wear a mask. Um, planes, I mean, the big thing with being on a plane is just, right, that, that, that plane is cruising at about 30,000 feet, roughly. We'd all pass out if that cabin were not pressurized. So the cabin gets pressurized about 8,000 feet, which if you're sitting and maybe you're okay, but that's, another, again, another advantage for those of you who live at sea level. Ask about getting HAS tests and just see, like, what's going to happen with me. Um, you can travel with oxygen, but you need to let the airline know. And what most of my patients are telling me is that they're now being reassigned to a seat by the window. And the reason for that is they don't want to have you on the aisle and then have some, like, 20-year-old who's in the middle seat step over and kick your oxygen concentrator when they're getting up to go to the bathroom. So, like I said, they're sitting next to the window. You need to have at least... Um, one and a half times the battery for the length of your flight, right? And that's just because if the flight gets delayed. But I don't know. I feel like everybody starts to play with this a little bit. They may find that when they're at a cruising altitude, they're able to turn their POC down to a lower number, and that's where you just spot check yourself with your pulse ox. Um, here we go. So it's 150% of the flight for batteries. Don't assume the plane is going to have a battery source. So when you get to the airport, get there early, recharge your concentrator while you're waiting for your flight. 
Um, the FAA actually has a great website for the approved <coughs> oxygen concentrators, and the reason for that is, like Anne Lee said, there's a lot of, I mean, it's ridiculous what's being sold right now online. And these devices are not um, approved. There's a couple like the underwriters laboratory or an FM level of approval. Um, they don't want you to get a device that's gonna short out their plane. So it's not like they're trying to be critical, they're just trying to make it safe. And um, my big thing is check your bags. There's nothing worse than getting to the airport, trying to put your suitcase in the overhead, manage your POC, so if your airline doesn't offer you checked luggage, just treat yourself to it. And also, um, a battery-powered concentrator does not count as a piece of carry-on luggage. So fight for your right on that one if they try and give you grief about it. Uh, being in a car, um, you know, the big thing is here is just don't stick the tanks in your trunk, please, right? Trunks get really hot. You can't really be in check of what's happening to it. Put it in the back seat. You can maybe put um, some cotton towels down to keep them cushioned, lay them on their side. Do not leave your oxygen in a hot car, okay? And uh, let's say you're you know, just running in maybe just quickly to the store and you have tanks, that's okay, but allow it to breathe, right? Crack your window, you don't wanna have the windows all sealed up with oxygen in your car. And uh, when this is, I just learned this as well and I never really thought about this. Um, if you're gonna charge your POC in your car, turn the engine on before you plug it in. Because if you take your POC and you put it into your car charger, you can actually drain your car battery without being aware of it, right? And I would have never known that because I'm not, my husband's grinning somewhere. I am not a car savvy engineering type person whatsoever. Um, and I would be the person that would kill my battery with my POC. Um, and then and talk to your, um, your manufacturer as well about making sure you've got a good car adapter as well. And then know where the rest stops are. Look ahead. I mean, remember back in the day when you got your AAA trip tick? And the really good thing about a trip tick was you were like, hey, I know that there's going to be a gas station. I know where I'm going to be able to stop. And where you can get out, walk, stretch your legs, get some electricity if you need to. Um, buses. Um, so actually, Greyhound will allow both POCs and compressed air tanks on the bus. Um, again, call ahead, make sure that the bus you're going to be on, a lot of the buses are now equipped with um, charging um, outlets, but don't just assume that you're getting on that, that you're going to have that. And then trains, I personally think train travel is wonderful. What I like about trains is that you're generally not as crowded, um, they're very peaceful. Um, Amtrak will allow um, an oxygen concentrator, and on their website they actually said something about allowing tanks. So I called Amtrak and I pretended like I had a patient that was about to get on the train. And uh, the woman I spoke with said, well, yeah, we allow tanks of oxygen, but they need to be empty. And I said, well, <laughs> what's that going to do? I mean, anyway, so I'm not sure. And again, she's probably 18, and, and maybe I didn't talk to the right person. Maybe they actually will allow full compressed air tanks, but um, be your own advocate. Make sure if you take a train trip, exactly. And they're, they have a little more strict um, on the battery requirement. They actually want you to be able to go four hours without um, electrical uh, accessibility, without a source. And again, these all have to be approved. The same, the same approval to be on a plane as the same approval to be on a train. And then boats. Um, a lot of my patients love to cruise, right? And um, not all cruise lines will allow you to have supplemental oxygen. Now, in my opinion, I think that's discrimination, and I think that that violates the Americans with Disabilities Act, but that's just my own little platform I'm gonna get on, but check your cruise line first. Verify in writing that they'll allow you to have a POC, um, and then make sure that um, you've got a plan in case there's a power outage on the ship. Um, also, a good tip is these ships are huge, right? I mean, they're enormous. Ask for a room that's by the elevator, right, so that you're not having to expend all your energy traipsing up and down the halls. And then um, Susan had uh, let me in on this company called Sea Puffers, and it was really cool. It was two women that ran a cruise, um, like travel industry, for people who use oxygen. And I looked on their website, and it looks like they're not offering the whole cruises anymore, but they're still offering some like um, tips or sort of concierge service to help you, but then I've called them and I've called them twice and they haven't called me back. So I really hope that that's not another um, thing that's gone past by the way with uh, the COVID pandemic. 
Uh, so last but not least, again, I think you can live your life very fully with supplemental oxygen. I want you all to recognize, I don't ever mean to say that, you know, just, oh, it's fine, I get it, that it's hard. But again, if you can think about this being an incredibly powerful weapon to help keep you strong, keep you healthy, um, please, you know, eyeball your home, get rid of the rugs, you know, eyeball your tubing, look to see if anybody's been chewing on it, uh, keep a good look on your skin, and uh, continue to stay fit and work on your balance. And then those are some resources you guys can check out. So I have... Uh a topic of kind of tips for choosing what's right for you, but it'll really kind of uh, highlight some things that weren't covered and there may be a few things that we'll repeat, so, and then we'll have plenty of time for some great questions, I'm sure. So we've talked a lot and I, I think you've probably heard in other sessions that, you know, treating low oxygen, which is what we call hypoxemia or low blood in the, low oxygen in the blood, is really just part of the symptom management, which is, everything we do to manage you that doesn't include a drug, right? So we want you to be educated, um, assess what we can do for your breathlessness, fatigue, any discomfort in the chest, and deconditioning. And so oxygen falls right in that, um, in that family of strategies, I have no disclosures. So in terms of data, because um, uh, both speakers have alluded to the survival benefit of oxygen in certain populations, so our the strongest data we have for survival is really based on two studies that were done in the 80s, believe it or not, and it was mainly with, with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients, but that benefit's been extrapolated to apply to other populations. And this was a benefit looking at patients who had resting hypoxemia. So these are patients that, at rest, had low blood oxygen levels. So it, you have to keep that in mind. That is the population who had a direct benefit with using oxygen at least 15 hours a day, and it improved survival. So this was very strong data, not in ILD patients, um, but is what really provides the basis for our recommendation for um, using continuous oxygen if you have resting hypoxemia. The other study that was done um, a little more recently, I think in, uh, I want to say 2000. 20s, um, looked at patients with COPD, again, that had mild resting hypoxemia. So this is a, not an oxygen level that would qualify you to get oxygen, or who desaturated um, with, ex with exertion. And it was a randomized trial. So one arm was assigned no oxygen, and the other was assigned oxygen. And in, after that population was followed, there was no difference in quality of life exercise symptom um, outcomes. But again, that was not the population that we are, that, that you all are. Um, these were milder patients, and it was in COPD. So the other data review was really more recent and published in uh, 2018, was our American Thoracic Society, what we call clinical practice guidelines. And this is a, an approach that very structured, uh, it's a very structured literature review by a trained methodologist and a medical librarian, and they actually search all available literature for any study that's looked at <coughs> oxygen use and its outcome, so, and determining where the important outcomes were. So it's a very, um, it's a very uh, specific process. So in a nutshell, <laughs> their findings confirm that there's moderate evidence for use of oxygen with resting hypoxemia, which is what we, I just talked about. The area that really lacks evidence is our patients who have exertion-only hypoxemia, which many of you in this room may have. And this is the patient who, when they exercise or exert themselves, their O2 saturations may drop below that 88% mark. And maybe it's down for an hour. Maybe it's down for an hour two or three times a day. That's the population that we don't know if it's harmful that over time it would shorten your survival. But our approach is, we, and, and you now you do qualify, we want you to use oxygen with exertion. We have other outcome data that I'll talk about in pulmonary rehab, that there's benefit from using oxygen when you exercise to keep your oxygen levels normal. You can exercise longer, you have less breathlessness, your heart rates are more controlled. So it's a little, you know, we, we need more data for the oxygen, for the exertion only, but
But that's a hard study to do, right? We'd be asking half of you to go exercise and drop your saturations and not provide oxygen. So we know, though, that exposure to long exposure periods to low oxygen puts a load on the heart, specifically that right side of the heart, the pressures go up, and we don't want you to develop side effects, cardiac side effects. So um, we want you to use your oxygen to keep your oxygen levels above normal, pretty logical. But the data piece comes up sometimes when we talk to, like, Medicare. They will say, well, what is the data that these patients need, for example, more health care resources? Are they in the emergency room more often? It's very hard to prove that with the exertion-only patients. So. so we talked a little bit about oximetry. We've already had the, the discussion on, on equipment. But just, again, there's three kinds. The compressed gas would come in those hard cylinders, portable and um, actually used to be some big stationary ones, but mainly portable um, and not so portable as we've seen. And then we have all the portable oxygen and stationary concentrators at the bottom kind of quarter of the screen there. And then the top right corner is our liquid, which um, we've talked about has been uh, very hard to access. And we're working to get that back. Um, with a targeted population for patients who require high flow, which we define as over three or four liters per minute continuous flow, because no portable oxygen concentrator supplies that. So that continuous flow that goes up you know, to 10 or 15, and that patient is mobile outside the home, that's what we're really lobbying to get that, that liquid access um, back so patients can get out and about we talked already about these two types of flow rates. This is critical information, and we are trying to also edu educate our clinicians. Um, and there's a lot of marketing that's not clear. And in fact, um, some of our members on our oxygen special interest group, we've had a call with the FDA, and we've actually sent them samples of advertising that claims that six on a POC equals six liters per minute, and it, it does not. <laughs> Um, really, no POC delivers over about two liters per minute, even on a setting of six, because of what Annelise and also um, Katie described. It's a pulse dose system. You only get that little pulse. And the higher your respiratory rate, the, the fewer milliliters per minute are delivered in that pulse in, in most of the, uh, the settings. So it's just important to be educated. And, and we've heard it, and we want to keep having that message when you're buying a POC, we really want you to talk to your care providers first and make sure um, it's adequate. And we would love to have you tested on that POC. Um, you know, there's a lot of interest now in how much money patients are paying out of pocket to get adequate oxygen devices so that they can get out of the house. Um, and we want Medicare and, and other uh, payers to hear that. So. We want you to follow your saturations. We don't want you kind of obsessed with your pulse oximeter, but we do want you to know, in general, what your sats are with exertion. Um, and that's, you know, we call it titrate to migrate. Uh, we really want you to know. And, and one thing I would point out is that when you call providers and you are saying, I'm not feeling well, I'm more short of breath, it's very helpful for us to know that you say, you know, I usually use three liters a minute when I walk around the block and my SATs are 92 to 94. And in the last three days, they've been 86 to 88 and I'm more breathless and I don't feel well. It's important data. So you should all know kind of your usual liter flow requirement based on your usual kind of activities. Very helpful for us. And the other piece is, if you are needing and are using more oxygen because of that scenario I described, we can't, your DME will not give you more tanks because their order says that you only need three liters per minute. If now you're needing six, we need to know so that we can write new orders to your DME so they will give you hopefully, you know, 10 e-tanks or as many as you need uh, to get out of the house. But they won't do that based on an, a, an older prescription. So keep everybody up to date when your oxygen needs change. And I alluded to this as well, um, that 
You know, it, so Medicare will only pay for one modality of a portable device. So what we would love to have, I think, for some patients, and we'll have our discussion later, we know that some of you need six to 10 liters when you're on a treadmill or doing your, your exercise or your pulmonary rehab. But if you're going to visit your grandchildren or going to out to dinner or to a religious service, you know, we kind of call it our shopping oxygen, a POC might be fine for you at that lower level of exertion. But God forbid that Medicare would give you both, right? So you, that's why we see patients spending money to get that other option. Um, so it's complicated to, to meet all of your uh, different types of activity needs. And I already said that, okay. So it's challenging when you need those higher flow rates. There's no really easy um, suggestion here. Uh, many patients get creative. Uh, this, uh, we have a patient, uh, she's actually not got ILD, she's got a rare um, lung disease called LAM, and she's a master's tennis player, and she needs about 10, six to 10 liters a minute, and she puts the smaller tanks in her backpack. She's got, and I would encourage you to explore different backpacks. Some are very, um, you know, there's some of them are the camelbacks that were made for water supply for runners, and they put the smaller tanks in and they fit more snugly. So patients can be active, like her playing tennis, and they're not, the tanks aren't moving around and she's able to do that. She changes her tank at every set. Um, and that's her garage. Now, it's another reason why you want the fire department to know that you have 20 cylinders of oxygen in your garage. So if there's a fire, they should know that. And you can see she has a home fill unit, which means that's the, the concentrator with that other device plopped on top so she can fill her own tanks. Um, it's, it's a bit of a slow fill for those. It's not fast, um, and they're smaller tanks. Um, another patient rigged a, a, a platform on his walker so he could bring up his two E-tanks and not have to drag them behind him, and it kept him independent, and he could, he had a friend build this little platform to manage those two E-tanks. So you do have to be creative and, and persevere, and I would encourage you all to share with each other. As, as Katie mentioned, and, and, and Annalise, you are the experts. You, you teach us a lot of how you, you know, cope and develop strategies to, to deal with your supplemental oxygen. Um, definitely try and conserve your oxygen and your nose um, by turning your rates down when you're sedentary and uh, not sedentary, but sitting. And uh, I'll talk about some device innovation later at the end. Um, and of course, some, if you don't have liquid or a bunch of e-tanks, you can exercise at home and perhaps use your stationary concentrator, get a high flow stationary concentrator that'll go to 10. There are great videos. There, we're really fighting for virtual rehab. There's um, a pulmonary toolkit from the PFF that has videos that she will lead you through at varying um, intensities. And remember, we'll talk about rehab. So there are some virtual options for exercise, and this way you could exercise in your home on high flow, um, because otherwise it's hard to walk outside when you don't have that high flow. And, and working with your clinicians. I mean, we will advocate as much as we can. Um, patients shouldn't have to beg for extra e-tanks so that they can take their, you know, either their spouse with medical problems, you know, go on their own to appointments, pulmonary rehab, and maybe they need an extra, you know, five e-tanks a week and to have their DME say, oh, we can only give you so much. It's just, uh, we really want to advocate for your mobility. Um, or we have patients that can't carry things upstairs. They're, you know, have, you know, joint issues. Um, and so that patient may need 20 smaller tanks so they can carry them up to their home. Uh, so we will try as much as we can. And we alluded to this, and we also had a discussion. We did have a phone call with the FDA, and we enlightened them, it was their device division, about these non-centrators. So this is a very large problem that's been more recent. So please, um, before purchasing, and we found that sometimes they'll purchase it, bring it to their clinician, and when they go back onto the site, the site's disappeared. So um, just beware. You know, if it sounds too good to be true, and these are often sold like three or four or five hundred dollars, which is a big red flag because most are, you know, two, three thousand dollars. Uh, Katie talked about some cannulas. The the oximizer pendant is an option that may help. Um, 
boosts your inspired oxygen um, on, a, on the same setting just by switching to this cannula. It provides a bit of a reservoir. It's called the pendant. Um, it's the one with the pendant hanging. The other one's a mustache, which is not quite as aesthetic. Um, but this pendant can, in some patients, can allow for a, a bit of a higher inspired concentration. So maybe um, instead of needing six liters, you might need four or five for your 30 minute walk, or maybe it'll help your sets uh, stay a bit higher on that six liters. Um, it's worth a try. Um, you can ask your physician to order them. They come through the DME, and I think you can also purchase them. They're a bit heavier on the ear. Some of our patients complain if they use them a lot, it, it's a bit more irritating um, behind the ear. And Katie talked about this as well. Uh, humidifying high flow oxygen, no petroleum, and again, I'm not marketing any of these products, but some of these are designed for oxygen users around the nose, and they're non-petroleum. So I'm going to end with pulmonary rehab. Um, I never know the slide, how big a font you can all see. But we really want you to be aware of uh, pulmonary rehabilitation as an option. It's a combination of education and exercise. And there's, a, I'll show you some sites. You can locate one that's near you if, if, if possible. They're not everywhere, which has been a, a barrier to access. Um, the program really helps, and in particular, around oxygen. You can really hone in on how much oxygen you need, um, teaching you some breathing techniques to maximize your um, oxygen intake, um, testing your, your equipment while you're there, and obviously learning the importance of exercise. Um, helping you with your equipment. There's really a lot of side benefits for the oxygen user with pulmonary rehab. So this is, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is the American Thoracic Society definition. I might read the whole thing. Uh, pulmonary rehab is an evidence-based, in other words, we've actually measured the outcomes. It does improve <coughs> certain outcomes. It's multidisciplinary, comprehensive intervention for patients with chronic respiratory disease who are symptomatic and often have decreased daily life activities. Integrated into the individualized treatment, very important, of the patient, pulmonary rehab is designed to reduce symptoms, optimize functional status, increase participation, and reduce healthcare costs through stabilizing and reversing systemic manifestations of the disease. So most of these programs, um, and they'll give you the site you can find them, in, on the average, are anywhere from really six to 12 weeks, meet two to three times a week, roughly for about one or two hours a session. Um, it's divided into education and exercise. And the education goes through multiple components, you know, um, how to know when to call the doctor, nutrition, anxiety management, um, understanding your medications, understanding exercise, breathing retraining, um, you know, end of life care, um, access to palliative care. So it's a a, a very um, structured educational components that are quite standard across all programs. And then exercise. And exercise addresses flexibility, aerobic capacity, and strength, which is what we all should be doing. Um, whether you do it sitting in a chair, on a treadmill, on a stationary bicycle, arm ergometer, uh, many options. Uh, Medicare and most private insurers do pay for this. Uh, you'll need a referral. And eligibility is based on pulmonary function. That varies for your disease state. And that's, uh, you can look at, uh, actually, you can also go on the PFF website for find a pulmonary rehab program. But it'll also, this is the American Association of Cardiovascular and Pulmonary uh, Rehab also has a site. So pulmonary rehab and exercise specifically can actually um, not only reduce the effect of inactivity. I've always said if you rest, you're going to rust. Um, but it, it actually can desensitize you a bit to the breathlessness. You may not be less breathless with the exertion, but it may bother you less. It may be less anxiety provoking because you'll be taught breathing techniques during that time. You'll be coached um, and you'll be coached also as how hard should I work? How short a breath should I get? And, and they'll interpret this and be given some home exercise guidelines because we really want you to continue it. Um, so there is a downward spiral that we see that patients understandably, they get shorter breath, they want to avoid that shortness of breath. It's uncomfortable. So you end up sometimes not even unknowing, unknowingly doing less and less 
and your deconditioning just gets worse and worse, and then you're needing more work of breathing. So it's kind of a vicious cycle we want to break. And everybody is different. So each one of you would have a different exercise prescription. Center base is very challenging. We don't have them everywhere. Many of our patients, you know, and I'm sure around you, you know, they're just not everywhere. So it's easy for us to say, go to a pulmonary rehab program. It's, it's not accessible. So there are home based um, and virtual. And actually, we're working very hard and actually um, AACBPR and some other groups in ATS to get reimbursement from Medicare for virtual programs. They would have to be standardized, certified um, to make sure they were up to the standard that we should have. So, and videos, and I see we have a Noah in back there at Greenspan who's got virtual. So there are some wonderful options. There's yoga online. I mean, I've had speakers do virtual support group for us at Stanford, walked us through wonderful exercises you know, across the whole gamut. So you have to really get creative because there's not, there not enough pulmonary rehab programs. And some in our area now have like a six month waiting list, which is hard. So I've gone through the, the benefits. Um, it really can cover the gamut of muscle weakness, endurance, discomfort from breathlessness, anxiety, panic, dis depression. And we really want you to be as independent as you can at home. And this is an older study actually, but it was done locally among three of our pulmonary rehab programs in the Bay Area. And they followed a, a, a cohort of almost 60 ILD <laughs> patients specifically. And I'll just, you can see the quality of life, the, the, the Bar, the first bar is pre and then post quality of life. And there was a the questionnaire, the lower the score was better. In the last group of bars, you can see depression came down. So there's a lot of side benefits to going to a rehab program. Um, and a lot of it's social support. You're around people like yourself. You, you know, you can really support each other. And so it addresses breathlessness. Breathlessness is very complex. I think you all know your triggers. You know, it, we hope you can develop strategies for that. Um, you know, oxygen alone does not relieve shortness of breath. I think that that was on uh, Annalise's slide. So you need other strategies. So exercise, breathing retraining, fan, open window, the sense of fresh air, um, relaxation, imagery, yoga. <coughs> And uh, you know, narcotics, opiates can help those uh, take off the edge of, of dyspnea for slip breathing and, and social support. And I think the expectations when you go on oxygen are important. Um, as clinicians, we need to provide you those expectations. And these are some patient reported comments, a lot of positive, you know, my heart doesn't pound as hard, I feel better, I'm not so exhausted. Even cough for some patients who will desaturate, um, find that the oxygen during those episodes helps their cough. Unmet expectations. I thought I was gonna be back to who I was. I still get out of breath, you know. I thought I wouldn't get out of breath. And then the anxiety of running, uh, worrying about running out and, and all those equipment. So the foundation provides great materials, but there's many materials online. Um, the American Lung Association has great videos. I would also mention CHEST has great videos. Um, there's an, a, a, a huge, well, I shouldn't say huge, but there's a huge increase, I would say, in online access in general. So it's top 10 tips, and then we'll have questions. Uh, notify your healthcare team if you're increasing needs of oxygen. We need to know. Alert us if you have stairs, other barriers, can't lift an E-tank, so we can really advocate and harass your DME to give you what you need. Always check before uh, purchasing a POC online uh, using your own money, and always get tested on your new equipment before you buy it to make sure it's adequate at rest and with exertion. Always bring your portable equipment to your appointment so we can see you on it and check it. Try to get to a pulmonary rehab program or some type of exercise, even in person or virtual. Watch videos. Know the types of devices and pulse versus continuous flow. And get creative using high flow portable oxygen. We are working on this and there's a lot of innovation going on. We can talk about that with questions. Um, but there are groups, and I think you heard our, the um, Matt, um, I'm sorry, the uh, NIH, that they put out a funding call and they have awarded four groups that are working on innovative devices to provide high flow and be light.